Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I want to show you how you can use Apache Flink to build a real time fraud detection pipeline. Um, so if you're not familiar with Apache Flink, check out some of my previous videos on it. Uh, but key thing that Apache Flink is really, really good at is doing true stateful just in time data processing where the second or millisecond really that a piece of data is created Apache Flink is then able to consistently and reliably take that piece of data, perform a series of operations on it, and then deposit it in some kind of sync or destination uh, data storage. Uh, and so this makes Apache Flink really good for the kind of use case we're going to go into today, which is things like real-time fraud detection. Um, so you know something banks have to deal with a lot of times is people trying to spoof transactions, um, you know really, really fast or making really, really fast or large withdrawals, um, you know, because, hey, let's say I get my hand on someone's credit card, I'm going to try and get as much money out of there as fast as possible before I get locked out, right? Um, and so what I'm going to show you today is, hey, let's use Apache Flank to stop that by monitoring all these transactions that come in and make sure that they are neither too large nor too fast. Um, so without further ado, no more preamble, let's get into it. Um, so to create a uh, Flink script, you're actually, you will need to write it in Java. Uh, Flink is a Java native uh, programming uh, tool. So here, just, I already named Flink, Flink fraud detection, but just add the dot Java at the end of it, uh, and then we can get started. And so what we'll do after we have, uh, in, you know, downloaded the, or created our file, is do what we do at the top of every script and import a whole list of libraries and functions. Um, so here, what we have, so a lot of these actually aren't just generic packages. They are pretty relevant to our use case because Flink provides a ton of tools out of the box to kind of build these fraud detection workflows. Um, and the first one is this watermark strategy. This is an interface that will provide classes to define watermarks, which are used for event time processing in Flink. And so the watermark strategy will define how watermarks are generated and then to assign to elements to make sure that each individual piece of data is only processed once and also allowing, you know, if I need to, to go back in time and reprocess data that maybe wasn't captured because of a lag or, or any other kind of issue. Then next we have the flat map function, which is a user defined function for transforming a single input element into zero, one or more output elements. And so this is going to be used for things like splitting strings or just manipulating the output uh, in a way that you know, causes it to be stored as multiple uh, outputs um, or zero, but typically multiple. Um, and then here next we have the map function, which is again, just a user defined function for transforming uh, one input element into one output element. So just simple transformations or mappings where you're just saying, hey, insert this row from this data source into this you know, data table or data destination. Next, we have the value state. Um, and this package contains the value state interface, uh, which represents a state that is accessible by the key of a keyed string. Um, and so this allows storing a single key value pair uh, and is useful stateful processing to say, hey, this data can only be processed once and is only assigned to this unique value uh, and this key. Then along with value state, we also just have the value state descriptor class, which is just basically a partner task that allows you to create and configure value states and include information like the state name and the type of state. Then we have tuple2, um, and this is just a generic tuple data type that can hold two values of potentially different types. Um, and this is just used in Flink to return multiple values from a single function. Um, and then next, the data stream class. This is something you're gonna have in pretty much every Flink. This is just allows you to create a data stream, um, create transformations, aggregations, windowing, et cetera. Uh, and then you also have the stream execution environment, creating an environment for Flink, for Flink to actually run in, uh, configure settings, and also actually execute the data flow. Um, and then here, we also have key process function. And this allows us to process elements of a keyed, of a keyed stream. Um, and this, this is, allows access to manually go into the stream and you know, to key state, key timers, insert information. Um, and then here, this is just bounded out of orderness watermarks. This is a watermark that will flag out of order events. Um, and also assume a bounded degree of out of orderness. So say, hey, an event could be late, but only up to a certain limit of lateness. Um, and then down here, time class allows you to define time intervals, pretty simple. And the collector class, which is used to emit records and user to define functions. So allowing you again to have multiple output records from a single function. 
And now that is all the packages and requirements out of the way. So now that we all have all of our imports out of the way, let's start building our first class, which is going to be fraud detection. Um, so here, what we're going to do is first create a class and then create our first main method here. Uh, so fraud detection main, where it's going to accept a string um, and then throw an exception if there's no string. Uh, and then within this, we're going to set up the execution environment here. So what this command will do is just create final execution environment, stream execution, just initiating that Flink environment that we will eventually need to actually execute our Flink statements. And then you're going to set up a source. So wherever you want to have your endpoint pointed to. So in this case, I'm going to do localhost and 8080. Um, and you know, this is just going to point it to my local Airflow environment. But you could point this to really whatever source you're using. Um, so data stream string. That just means it's going to take the output of this source as a string. And then what we'll do next is imagine that the output of this is a transaction. So transactions are being generated from this endpoint. Um, so, you know, this in real world would be, you know, banking ATM, let's say, or just, you know, a web portal. And so here within this, what we're then going to define is a series of actions that are going to process that and parse the incoming transaction. So here we have our transaction screen, which is going to use that map function to say, hey, string field so split the value that's coming in um, as a transaction field one and field two um, so we're going to split our transaction object um, into fields with transaction id account id amount and timestamp um, so it's going to be uh, multiple and you can see that here where you have uh, you know just fields one and two which are just the ids but then the amount we're going to save as a double and timestamp we're going to save as a long um, so choosing the different types of variables we want to save these at. And then we're going to also assign timestamps and watermarks. So these are going to handle out of order events with a maximum out of orderness of five seconds. So if you know one, for whatever reason, one transaction from one user comes in after another, even if that user uh, triggered its transaction before, this will allow us to process that properly, but also with the safeguard against you know allowing two out of date events to, or dates that are too out of <laughs> transactions that are too out of date to actually be processed. Then what we'll do is create a key for each of these new objects. So assign them their key as their uh, account ID. So that's their unique identifier. Then what we'll do is print any alerts that were generated um, just in case you know there are any errors that happened. So make sure those were alerted on those. And then down here, we will execute the job. So here, environment, execute. Um, and real-time fraud detection. So this is just going to execute our environment uh, and call it real-time fraud detection. Next, we're going to create another class called transaction. Uh, and this is how we're going to define the object of a transaction uh, and then also you know, allow us to basically treat this as an object rather than just a series of rows. Um, so here what we'll do is initialize this new class. So public static class transaction. Uh, and then initialize some variables, so private string, transaction ID, account ID, amount, timestamp, and just making sure I'm saving those all with the same type that I defined previously in my mapping function. Then, once I'm done with that, just define the public transaction array, um, and then also have this public transaction object where, again, just defining, hey, this is how we're aligning transaction ID into each uh, transaction specifically. Um, so just defining the pathways from that initial data source into this transaction object uh, and then returning that. So if we call this class down the line, this will each transaction when called by its account ID will return the rest of these variables. Then next we're also going to create a second class that's actually going to be our fraud alert. Um, and so this is just really going to be how we're going to structure our fraud alert if we uh, see any fraud potentially arise. So here we have our private string account ID, private string message, and then we're going to build an array of different fraud alerts. Um, and so this is just a new object to contain our, or obtain a list of these new fraud alert objects. So this way, you'll see we're each creating a new fraud alert with account ID and a string of message. So that's what those two variables up there are being used for. And then we're going to return them as well. So just provide a way for me to access the variables stored within this fraud alert. Um, and then we're also going to add an override. So convert this to string. So after we get returned the account ID and message, actually override that and build a message 
here uh, using this kind of template of fraud alert, account ID equals account ID, um, and then creating a new line. Message is, hey, you know, this is the type of fraud that they're potentially uh, trying to commit. Um, and so that's what we're then going to use in the function that's really going to tie it all together. And that is our fraud detector. Um, and so here we have is a fraud detector that's extending that keyed process function that it allows you to process data as it arise, arrives in your system. Um, and you can see here it's passing in string, it's gonna receive string, transaction, and fraud alert as objects. Um, and then within this, we are going to define what we think is a large amount of money to be uh, transacted at a single point in time. So we wanna receive alert at it. And also a time interval. So this is 10,000 L, and that is equivalent to 10 seconds in Unix time. Um, and so basically we want to say if, and eventually what we're going to do is say, hey, if they uh, make more than five transactions in 10 seconds, there's probably something fishy going on. So once we've gotten those defined, we're then going to define a state to keep track of the last transaction timestamp. Um, so this is just going to allow us to say, hey, when was the last transaction processed by this account? Um, and then have another override function, which is going to take uh, configurations here, so take the last transaction time, um, and then get runtime context and get the state of the previous transaction to actually get that last transaction time state. Um, so just defining a function to actually extract the time state. And then we're gonna tie it all together now down here with a big function, so get ready for a lot of the screen. Uh, with this override function, which is going to be our uh, fraud detector. Um, so here we have is vo public void proce process element. This is going to use this last transaction time and also check the amount of our transaction to make sure that it doesn't appear fraudulent. So here, long last transaction time is just pulling in that last transaction time state. And then here we're just saying, hey, is the transaction uh, within, uh, is the amount of the transaction over $10,000? If it is, then we're going to use that fraud alert to generate an alert that's going to say large transaction detected along with the rest of that fraud alert. So this is the message that will be sent. Um, and then we also have the last transaction time checker. So here we are saying, hey, was this uh, new transaction actually uh, created with, less than 10 seconds from its previous transaction. Most of the times you're not gonna be withdrawing money in 10 second increments. So this is a pretty good check of, hey, are they potentially bringing some, or uh, are they potentially compromised, right? And then once it is checked that, also we're gonna have a function here that's gonna update the last transaction time state. And that's really it. That's all you need to do to build a fraud detection pipeline with Apache Flink. Super useful tool and also super easy to use and, and get a lot of value out of it. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.